Today we're going to look at Daniel's leadership secrets, but before we get there, we're going to look at the context of Daniel's day, which was set by Jeremiah. Jeremiah says in the beginning of his book, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So this is the status for all of us, that God knows us before we are even formed in the womb, that God knows the ancestors that went before us, all our history before we had any idea what was happening to the generations that came together that formed us. God knew all about us. God told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. So many times you're watching a young child and you realize somewhere around uh, ages two or three or four that you can see aspects of their personality that you'll still see as an adult. That there are characteristics about them that you see, wow, I have a good idea of where you're headed, even though it's very early in the person's development. God tells Jeremiah, before you were born, I chose before it was apparent which way you'd be heading. Before you were born, I consecrated you and I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. So before Jeremiah started to make decisions, before God could tell, would Jeremiah be faithful? Would he be a good person? Would he be wise? Before God could tell anything about the kinds of choices Jeremiah would be making, God chose Jeremiah. I appointed you to be a prophet, God tells Jeremiah. And Jeremiah's response is, I can't do that. I'm too young. Jeremiah says, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a boy. And God's response is, Don't say I'm only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I'm with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Well, if God ever tells you something like, Don't be afraid of where I'm sending you, that's probably bad news because it means you have a good reason to be afraid as you head out that direction, that there will be people in opposition or that, that there are circumstances that your natural person might be afraid of, but you are instructed, don't be afraid. That was the case for Jeremiah. Jeremiah was told, don't be afraid of the people I'm sending you to because I'm going to deliver you. Then Jeremiah says, Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. So God gives the words to Jeremiah to speak. And Jeremiah speaks truth to the people of his day who didn't want to hear it. And uh, Jeremiah uh, announces the complaint of God in the second chapter. God says, my people have changed their glory for something that doesn't profit. They've taken something immensely valuable, but they didn't see the value in it. Esau didn't see the value in his birthright. My people have changed their glory, not recognizing the value of it, and they've traded it for something that doesn't profit. They've committed two evils, God says. They've, t they've forsaken me, the fountain of living water. So they've taken a source of good water and abandon it. And because they needed something in its place, they've dug out sisters for, cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. So God's complaint is twofold. First, that they had a good thing and they abandon it. And then if you give up on God and God's ways, you will have a vacuum that you will need to fill some way. And many people in rejecting God's path for them, pursue addictions or some uh, various things that are bad for them because they need to fill the hole that they've created by not following God and not following God's ways. So this is the complaint that God has through Jeremiah for all of Israel, that all of Israel is doing this. And uh, Jeremiah com had this message and he writes in the 29th chapter, for 23 years, the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken persistently to you, but you have not listened. So Jeremiah had a message that he kept delivering to the people and especially to the leaders, but for 23 years they rejected what he was saying, 
and wouldn't listen. Jeremiah didn't have an easy task. Because they haven't listened, verse 8, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Because you have not obeyed my words, I am going to send for all the tribes of the north, even for King Nebuchadrezzar, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants, and against all the nations around. I will utterly destroy them, and I will make them an object of horror and hissing and an everlasting disgrace. So God pronounces judgment in a couple ways that are striking or would be striking to the people of that day. He says, you know this king that is an idolater and freely uh, decides people whether they should live or die, freely murders people. You know this king that you think is no good, he's my servant. And I'm going to bring him to take over the land because you have not listened to me for the 23 years that Jeremiah has been prophesying to you. One of the things that happens when you have a prophet in your midst like Jeremiah is that prophets are people. And when Jeremiah was speaking these words, Jeremiah wasn't the only prophet who was speaking. There were many other prophets who were speaking messages that were contrary to Jeremiah's. So how are you able to tell the difference or distinguish between which one is right and which one is saying things that aren't true? Because prophets are people and as a result, when they speak for God, they are not God. So they may have words from God, but they are not God when they're saying them and sometimes they are immature and get things a little not quite right. Sometimes they're sinful and they can't hear God because of actions they've taken. Sometimes they're in error. They make mistakes. They might be misguided. They might be mistaken. Sometimes they speak God's word. But sometimes when they speak God's word, they give you 90% God's word and then 10% their hope or their fear or their uh, desire to please you or their condemnation or something about that, you know, that their own spirit gets mixed into the message sometimes. So when you have a message that someone is saying, this is God's word for you or Maybe they're not putting it that directly. Maybe they're just saying, here's a direction that you should go. This is something for your life. How can you tell the good from the bad? At the time Jeremiah was prophesying, God's call to repentance. Others were prophesying, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to take action because everything's fine. So how can you tell the difference? John, in his first letter, writes, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. And a couple months ago, we looked at this question, how can you tell if it's God? And one of the things we pointed out was that you can tell God's voice more by its tone than its content. Both God and Satan can give you the same piece of information. You can't tell by the information whether it's from God or an enemy of your, of your spirit. Uh, so as a for instance, God might reveal to you that someone is sinning, and Satan might also reveal to you that someone is sinning. But when Satan reveals that information to you, it's in order to incite or condemn or to shame or to bring separation. When God reveals to you that someone is sinning, it's in order to bring compassion and mercy and rescue. And so the objective of both God and Satan are vastly different. So you can kind of get a feel for who might be giving you the information based on the feeling that comes with it. If as you're uh, sensing something, what the sense that you have is, uh, is of anger or of judgment or of condemnation, it's probably not God. God giving you information would give it with a spirit that matches the fruit of the spirit, so love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, as you're feeling those kinds of things, then it's a good sign that it might be God. So questions that are not filters, questions that won't help you decide if it's God or not. Do I like the message? For 23 years, Jeremiah spoke the message of God and the people didn't like it and they rejected it. The leaders rejected it. They didn't like the message. Is the message difficult to accept? That won't help you tell if it's God or not. The message that Jeremiah had was difficult for the people to accept. He was telling them that God was abandoning them and choosing a foreign idolatrous king as his servant. Is the message, call me to an action that's difficult? That won't help you decide if it's God or not. Although often God does call us to actions that are difficult. Is the message conventional? That won't help you be able to tell if it's a message from God or not. God often asks people to do unconventional things. So there are some helpful questions that are red lights that mean that you should not pursue it if, if you answer these questions. Does it lead to sin? If it leads to sin, you should not pursue it. Is it consistent with the functions of Satan? That is, uh, is it causing you to head the direction of lying or cheating, killing, destroying, inciting, or accusing. If it's heading that direction, you shouldn't do it. That, that's the direction that the enemy wants you to go. Does it cause you to slack off on something that would be good to do? We looked a couple weeks ago at prophecy, and one of the things that happens when there are a few prophets to not enough prophets is that there's no one to say, you need to be working on this particular thing because it doesn't seem that important now, but you need it for the future, and there's no time in the future to, to, uh, to take action on this. So uh, does it cause you to slack off on something that would be good to do? That's a red light. Does it go against what you know about God from the Bible? That's a red light. You shouldn't do it. Now, there are also some helpful questions that are green lights. They indicate that you should do it, you should pursue it. So is it consistent with the Bible? You should go ahead with the thing that you uh, think it might be a prompting from God, the idea that comes to you. You should pursue it and see what happens. Is, does it witness to the love of God and the compassion of Jesus? You should go ahead on these things. They're green-lighted. Is my spirit at peace? That's a good clue that it, it might be worth checking out. It is worth checking out to see what happens as you do it. Will it further the kingdom of God? This is a great green lot. Will it produce good fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. It's a good green lot. And is it consistent with the functions of God's spirit? So as people are evaluating the ideas that are all around them, including the prophetic voices they hear, for more than 20 years, what Jeremiah prophesied did not come true. So sometimes people say, well, if it's God, it'll come true. So I can tell by whether a prophet is from God or not just by looking to see whether his words come true or not. That's true if you're able to look over a perspective of 1,000 or, or 2,000 years. But we're still waiting for some prophecies to take place that were made 2,000 years ago or more. Some prophecies took place and were fulfilled, but they took 500 years to fulfill. Jeremiah's prophecies took t more than 20 years to fulfill. They were true, but for the first 20 years you couldn't tell. There was no evidence. So a lot of times that in your lifetime, there won't be enough years to be able to tell if the prophet is speaking God's word or not just by whether things come true. Then, one day, after 20 years of speaking into this culture and being ignored and being rejected, what Jeremiah's prophesying, prophesying came to pass. Suddenly, the country was overrun by, this, uh, by King Nebuchadnezzar and its leaders were taken off into captivity and Jeremiah was proved right. Jeremiah 29.4 says this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles, 
So Jeremiah now has a new message, and the message is going out to the people who are carted off into captivity. The leaders who thought, um, who maybe are thinking, well, I sure hope this doesn't last too long. Maybe if we escape, maybe, I mean, the, who knows what they were thinking, but they were going to a foreign land in chains, and they probably didn't have high hopes for living there a long time. Jeremiah says, I've got a new word from God for you. This is for all the exiles. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. I don't know if you've planted any gardens, but if you do, you know that it, you put down the seed and you're not going to harvest anything the next day. For almost everything, it's at least a three-month cycle. In some cases, it's a one-year cycle. And for fruit trees, it's a five-year, three, four, five-year cycle before you get any fruit. Plant houses, or build houses, and plant gardens, and eat their produce. It's going to be a while, God tells the captive. Settle down. It's going to be a while. God says, take wives and have sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters in marriage. In other words, it's not just going to be your generation that's there. Your sons and daughters are going to be there, and they should also settle and be glad with the country that they're in. The new land that you don't want to be in, it's where you're going to stay for a while. God says, seek the welfare of the city, where I have sent you into exile. Many people might have thought, oh, this is nothing to do with our God. This is Nebuchadnezzar has just taken us captive. But God says, no, I, God, have sent you into exile. You wouldn't listen to Jeremiah. You wouldn't change. You wouldn't do the things that you are called to do. So you're in a timeout. The timeout's going to last 70 years. And in that 70 years, you can prosper. But the way to prosper is to seek the welfare of the city where you are. There's an expression, bloom where you're planted. You may not like the company that you're working for. You may not like the city you, you're living in or the house you're in. God told the exiles who definitely didn't like the situation they were in, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. I hear from people all the time over the uh, course of the various presidents that we have. No matter who's in power, I hear somebody say, they're not my president. I'm not going to support them. God has a different view. God's view is, you need to bless them because what happens to the leader happens to the country and influences the lives of everybody in that country. So bless the leader. They may not be your political party. And if you've been voting for more than 20 years, some of the time you've had your candidates in the White House probably, and some of the time you've, had your can you've not had your candidate in the White House, certainly. God says, pray for those leaders. Pray to the Lord on behalf of the leaders for the people who are taken into exile. Pray on behalf of the captors, the people who took you away. For in the city's welfare of your enemy, you will find your welfare. Thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you. And then there's a verse that you may have memorized. For surely I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. And as God is speaking this, God, many times when people hear this verse, they, they think, oh, the plans that God has for me down the road. But no, God, in, in this instance, we can see God was speaking to people about something that they needed to hear that was going to last for 70 years. In other words, the entire lifetime of the initial hearers. The people who heard this message initially, 
they were not going to get out of Babylon. They were going to stay there because they were going to be there 70 years and many people, almost every, all of them would die within that 70 year span. Their sons and daughters might get out. Their grandkids probably would get out, but they would not. When God says, surely I know, I know, surely I know the plans I have for you, he's speaking to people about their time in captivity. The plans I have for you, says the Lord, are plans for your welfare and not for your harm, to give you a future with hope. You that are going to live the entire rest of your lifespan in captivity, I have good plans for you. I think one of the things that you can take out of this is that there's no circumstance that you're in that isn't beyond God's redemption, that God can redeem and transform any spot that you're in. That doesn't mean every spot that you're in is one that you should stay in. But if God has put you in a spot and, and that's where you're to be, you can be blessed in that spot, no matter where it is. Well, Daniel was one of the people who was taken into captivity. He was taken into captivity as a youth. And we don't know for sure that he heard Jeremiah's words, but he certainly acted like he heard Jeremiah's call to bless the land and lived it out. He could, Daniel could have been uh, pouty, he could have been withdrawn, he could have been angry, he could have been insolent. He chose none of those options. He did not get bitter. He decided in the new land to prosper by prospering, helping the new land to prosper. Even though he was taken there in captivity, he decided he was going to bless that new land and pour out everything he could to be a blessing there. So in terms of Daniel's leadership secrets, here's a few from the book of Daniel, which I commend to your reading this week. Daniel 1. Daniel was faithful to God in a foreign land. In the land where he went, God was not the dominant God. There were dozens of gods and, uh, and most everybody worshiped somebody other than Daniel's God. But Daniel knew that Yahweh was the living God and Daniel continued to worship God in spite of the fact that he was in a, in a place where that was either unknown or was not the majority and stood out. Daniel took initiative and fought to be faithful. So Daniel was a leader and, uh, and when he saw something that needed correcting, if nobody else was standing up, he stood up. He took initiative and he fought to be faithful. Daniel was polite, but he was also direct. So when he went to people in positions of leadership, he was polite, but he also didn't hammer haw. He made the point directly. Daniel had a community of friends who knew how to pray. So he had friends who were also passionately seeking to follow the God from Jerusalem, even though they were in a foreign land. They, they might have said <clears throat> that God didn't help us. We're going to choose one of the new gods of the new land. But he had, Daniel had a community of friends that were on the same page as he was. And it was extraordinarily helpful because he knew he had a backup team who would help him when, when he needed people to pray with him. He could count on them. Daniel gave credit for his skills to God. This is something that as you read Daniel, that Daniel knew, but the kings that he served didn't always know this. So a number of, of the kings that Daniel served got into trouble because they did not give credit to God. They took the credit for themselves. And it's fairly easy to do if you're working very hard. You think that the things that are resulting from my hard work are because I'm working so hard. But that's not the case because you probably know people who are working hard and are not getting good results. People who are working hard and can't get ahead. So hard work doesn't do it. 
But what does it is the favor of God, the blessing of God. So Daniel knew that in spite of the fact that he was very accomplished, highly skilled, and had worked hard to get there, that all that he had was a blessing from God, and he gave God credit for it. Daniel wished for the uh, best for the leader of the land in spite of the leader's faults. So the leader of the land was an idolater. He killed people at, at whim. Uh, he had a lot of characteristics that Daniel no doubt did not care for because Daniel knew what justice was. But in spite of the fact that the leader was imperfect, Daniel wished the best for him and served him as best he could. Daniel spoke the truth to power. So a lot of times people, when they're in, in uh, speaking to someone who's powerful, they will not bring up what the person really needs to hear. They will sugarcoat the truth or not say it at all. Daniel spoke the truth to power. Daniel was not interested in profiteering. When he had a chance to make money, income, extra income off of the gifts and skills that he had worked so hard to develop. He did not take extra profits for them. Daniel remained faithful in spite of the ups and downs of favor. Over the course of the 70 years that Daniel was in, uh, in captivity, he served some of the highest kings in the land and, for, and sometimes was almost unknown still remembered from people who remember the prior administration, but not serving in a meaningful capacity in the new administration until a crisis hit. And then sometimes he would be called on again. No matter where he stood in terms of influence, in terms of being appreciated by the leadership, in terms of being well-known, Daniel remained faithful to God who loved him. Daniel 6, Darius set, up, uh, set over the kingdom 120 governors. So there's, he's divided his land into 120 different districts, put 120 leaders over them. And then over these 120 leaders, he's put three presidents. One of the three is Daniel. So Daniel has probably about 40, uh, 40 of these governors that he's in charge of. And as he's administrating and working with the 40 governors, the king looks and sees that Daniel is so accomplished that his team is functioning far better than any of the other team. Daniel is really doing a great job. So the king decides that uh, he's going to choose Daniel to be over everything. When the king makes this decision and makes it known, the 120 governors, some of them at least, and the other two presidents decided that they didn't want Daniel to have this much favor. And so they decided to try and find a reason to complain against him. And hopefully you'll be in this status that Daniel was. 120 people, give or take, were trying to find out something bad about Daniel they couldn't find anything. Because Daniel was faithful, the text says, no negligence or corruption could be found in him, even though there was a large number of people trying to find it. They finally concluded, we can't find anything to complain about unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. There's nothing about Daniel that, that we could complain about, so we'll have to figure out some way to get in, in trouble because, because of his faithfulness to God. So these uh, governors came to the king, King Darius, and said, Oh, King Darius, live forever. We're all agreed that the king should establish an ordinance that whoever prays to anyone for 30 days except to you should be thrown into a den of lions. Now, Darius was in a spot where a lot of people thought he was God and where maybe you know there are some people in the 20th century and the 21st century who were as ego-driven and who believe that they are gods 
and who it's hard to believe in this century that there are people who think that, but in some of the countries of the world, that's the case. And Darius was one of those kinds of leaders. He thought, yeah, uh, it would be good if everybody really acknowledged that, that I'm the most important. So Darius agreed, and although Daniel knew that this document had been signed, you can't pray to anybody except to the king, if you do, you'll be thrown into a den of, den of lions. Daniel does what he always does. He continued to get down on his knees three times a day and pray to his God. I believe that this is the source of his power. I could be wrong on this. We, over the last five minutes, we've looked at all kinds of characteristics about Daniel that indicate he had a lot of leadership ability. He had a lot of uh, prophetic ability we haven't touched on, but it's in the text that we, uh, in Daniel 1 through 6, if you read it over this week. There's lots and lots of gifting that Daniel has. But I believe that the source of his power is this. There are many parents who tell me, well, I, I've, I've got this, um, this little one, I don't have any time. And I can certainly understand that. There's many CEOs or people in positions of authority who say, I've got all this stuff to manage, and I, I don't just don't have any time. I've, I'm overwhelmed. I can't possibly squeeze anything in except what I'm already doing, which is running ragged. Daniel had a different outlook. He was in charge of 40 districts, and because he had so much authority, he three times a day got down on his knees and talked to God about it. I think if you're this focused on continually taking your problems to God and continually focusing on God, that it will be worth it. And one of the things that I've left out of the text so far is, I think, extraordinarily crucial to it. He prayed to God and praised Him. One of the things that many of us do when we go to God is we go to God with our problems. And we, when we take God our problems, we focus on the problems. And instead of giving glory and honor to God, we focus on the problems and how big they are and how inadequate we are and, and it's like we worship the problem instead of worshiping God who can solve the problem or, or lead us to a solution. When you're praising, praising God, then your eyes are open to God who loves you and who is able to do anything. And you see, the perspective different from when all you're doing is looking at a problem and just focusing on that. So it's good to spend three times a day in prayer to God, but I think it's far, far better to do what Daniel did. Three times a day, he prayed to God and praised Him. So three times throughout his day, he will be coming on his knees to God, saying, here's what's going on, and glory to you. That kind of attitude, that kind of uh, change in thinking will really help go far and help you do a lot if you keep remembering God is overall. God can handle this. I do not. I have to handle this. I can do my best and then God can do the rest. Three times a day he spoke to God and praised Him. The conspirators came and found Daniel praying and seeking mercy before his God. When they heard, uh, when they told the king, the king realized this whole thing was a trap for Daniel, the best person in the land. And the king was about to lose him because of his egotistical foolishness. The king tried for all day to try and uh, figure out a way to set Daniel free, but he could not. So at the end of the day, uh, he put Daniel in the lion's den, 
rolled a stone over it, sealed it with his signet ring so that no one could break the seal. And he called out to Daniel, may your God whom you serve so faithfully deliver you. And then he spent a restless night wondering if his foolishness had cost him the best leader in the land, the best administrator, he got no sleep. The next morning at the break of day, the king got up and hurried to the den of lions and called out, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you so faithfully served, been able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel called out, he has. So the king, as he's writing about this experience to all his country now, blesses the land that he's, that he's ch charged with. He writes, may you have abundant prosperity. In all my royal dominion, people should tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. The king had just earlier said, oh, I'm the biggest in this, in this country, but now he's writing and saying, no, it's the God of Daniel that you should worship, for he's the living God, enduring forever. And one of the themes about Daniel as you're reading the first six chapters is that God is the living God who endures forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion has no end. He delivers and rescues and works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Well, as I was thinking about this message and uh, preparing for it, there is something that I thought of earlier in the week that I had much more enthusiasm for earlier in the week than I have at the end of the week. It, it seemed to me at the start of the week as I was preparing this message that, that we really should just sign up to do what Daniel did, to pray and praise God three times a day. And, and Daniel, um, did this for 30 days when there was a when he was told he couldn't or he shouldn't. So I thought, well, we should have as a challenge that we're going to do this for 30 days just to try it out and see what happens. If we pray and praise God three times a day, what does it feel like? How how our attitudes change? How do our circumstances change? Is it worth continuing the experience experience more than 30 days? Daniel, of course did it for its lifetime, not just the 30-day period, but for us, for the experiment, to pray and praise God three times a day. And what I discovered since I had this week to practice is that it's way harder than it looks, at least for me. I was never able to do it so far three times a day, and I was able a couple times to work it in once a day. So for me, building in this habit is going to take some effort. It may be very easy for you, but for me, it's going to take some effort to build this, this habit in, even though I believe that it's quite worthwhile. Uh, some of the things that I think are important to emphasize are that when we're praying to God, we're not just bringing God our trash, we're also praising God. So the, much of this time is in praise to God. And so when you're praising God, some things that might help you be more regular about it is maybe on a walk. If you've got a dog, you've got some built-in times where you can just go out and praise God as your dog drags you around, or depending on what kind of dog you have, as you drag your dog around. On a walk is often a helpful thing. Singing hymns might be helpful as a way to praise God. Maybe having these uh, prayer times with others will be helpful. But if you're willing to do this, I encourage you on your uh, attendance card to write down uh, that, you're, the, that you're willing to do this, and then we'll get in touch with you and give you some resources. Next week, I think it'd be helpful for those of us who are trying this out to get together in the library and talk and see, compare notes, see if we can give each other encouragement and maybe some ideas and resources. Uh, so hopefully you'll check in next Sunday after trying for a week to see how it goes. But I encourage you to try it out. Three times a day, Daniel was on his knees praying and praising God. And I'd encourage you three times a day to pray and praise God uh, over the course of the next 30 days. And let's just see what happens. We're going to take a moment for prayer. 
God, we thank you for your amazing mercy, for uh, the example of great leaders like Daniel, who through thick and thin, in spite of whether they were high or low in the kingdom that particular year, they remained faithful to you. Even when it was extraordinarily difficult, even when their life was on the line, they remained faithful to you. So thank you for the leaders who have been such great examples. We ask that you help us to have that kind of faith and faithfulness. And it's, there's many times people proclaim things that they say everybody should do when it's really their gifting. So some people who are prophets sometimes say everybody should develop this gift. Sometimes people who have the gift of healing say everybody should develop this gift. And it's true that we all should encourage one another and build up one another and console one another, the functions of being a prophet. And it's true that we should all bring your healing, God, to everyone that we can. But some people major in things and are gifted for that. So it may be that Daniel was just especially gifted for intercession. And maybe it's not right that we copy him. But to the extent that it's good that we follow Daniel's example, ask that you give us the grace to discover how good it is. Thank you, Jesus, for all you do for us. We praise you. Amen.